I read a story some years ago about a caretaker of a very famous garden in Europe. Uh, the garden was owned uh, along the grounds of a house. It was a beautiful garden, acres and acres just desig designated to this garden, really inspired by the Babylonian gardens. And um, the owner was this multi-billionaire who never really spent any time at his home there because he had different homes across the world. But the garden was in pristine shape, perfect shape. And uh, the garden was so famous that some news people came out there and they were talking to the head caregiver for the garden. And they said, this is the most beautiful garden I've ever seen. It's, it's in such shape. Um, it's as if you're preparing for the owner to even come tomorrow. And the gardener corrected this person and said, no, I'm preparing as if the owner is coming today. One of the songs that we sung here is that the earth groans for you. We are to groan for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church, and then we will be with him in his second coming after a seven-year tribulation period. We should groan for him, which would cause us to be interested in prophecy. It is shocking to me how uninterested you guys, just so you know, the shaking on that is the bass from the church behind us. If you're ever wondering if it makes you dizzy, that's the bass behind us. They love loud bass. Is that OCD? The, the groaning we should have, it involves us knowing the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. As I had mentioned, and this will, and, and I hope none of you say amen to this, uh, this will be the last week until we return to Romans in prophecy. Good. Um, it amazes me how much Christians are uninterested in prophecy. It also amazes me how much different denominations are uninterested in prophecy. Remember, the Bible is as much as 29% direct references to prophecy and as much as direct and indirect references to prophecy it could be as much as 40 percent of the bible that is closing in on half of the bible has i either direct around 27 29 percent or indirect connection to prophecy prophecy is the foretelling of the future um, this is called eschatology, eschatological doctrines. And if the Bible is that much, how much should we be studying it? Can you put Preston a little more volume or gain or something in here? It seems dead. And it, it, guys, it amazes me how many people are interested. Go ask people. Go ask people about the book of Daniel. Ask people about the images in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. And I'm not trying to embarrass anyone here. I, I don't want you to feel bad over this, um, but me merely trying to challenge us. If you were asked that question, what would you say? I mean, you, we have this, oh man, that's great. Just a little too much, thank you. <laughs> they have such a hard job having to deal with me, guys. Thank you, media team. Um, so, that's perfect. The, the, these prophecies, we should know. It inspires our faith. Jesus Christ would say, and I know we're doing a lot of review all the time, but Jesus Christ would say, I tell you these things in advance that you might, the baby said it, believe that you might believe. Prophecy helps us have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It, 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 it strengthens us to say, wow, 
This truly is the infallible, inspired word of God. So when you are to, if somebody was to come ask, and I challenge you, what is Daniel 2? What are the images? Would you be able to tell them about the images that represent from the head all the way down to the feet that represents the Babylonian empire? Now, that prophecy was given to Daniel during the Babylonian empire. So that's not that difficult of God to do. Even Daniel knows about the, dif- uh, the Babylonian empire. But then he goes down and below the Bab- Babylonian empire is the Medo-Persian empire. Well, they heard about the Persians and the Persians are actually gonna, getting ready to take over Babylon. But they hadn't heard about the Greek empire. And that was prophesied in Daniel 2. They hadn't heard about the Roman Empire, and that was prophesied in Daniel 2. And so these prophecies increase our faith. And it causes us to groan for our Lord Jesus Christ, especially when we see the signs and the times of his coming. Dwight Eisenhower, an American president, heard about a child who was terminally ill of cancer. And the child kept writing him because he knew, or or the child, his lifelong dream was to meet the President of the United States of America. So Dwight Eisenhower knew he he was in the area, and they got the address, and they didn't even call. And so they show up to this house in the presidential limousine, where the secret service, or his bodyguard at the time, um, got out of the presidential limousine. They went over to the house and they knocked on the door. And the father to this terminally ill child answered the door in a dirty white t-shirt with food stains on it, with a three-day unshaved face and blue jeans and no shoes on, and his hair wasn't kept. And he opens the door to the President of the United States of America. And he says, hey, may I see your son? I'm here to visit him. He's been writing us letters. And he came out and he saw the presidential limousine. You know who was the most embarrassed that day was the father. He had no idea the President of the United States was coming. How much more should we be ready for the Lord Jesus Christ? He gives us parables concerning prophecies of his coming, the parable of the five virgins who were ready with their candles lit and the five virgins who were not ready with their candles not lit. Which one are you? Do you groan? And this illustration may not work well, but I want to give it again because I like it. But if you've never seen the Marvel movie, Thor, this won't make much sense to you. And I know most of you ladies have seen the Marvel movie Thor, so just calm down. So he's this demigod on a planet. Please follow me. This is really nerdy, and my wife is going to give me a hard time after the service. He's a demigod on a planet called Asgard. You with me so far? And he, in his pride, gets cast out of his world By his father to learn humility, he gets thrown down to earth. He falls in love with a girl. I hate hate that term, falls in love, sorry. He begins to love a girl, and he learns humility. So his father invites him back to the plant to take his rightful place as the king. Now, there is one person on the planet who can see the rest of the universe, his friend Heimdall. Is this too nerdy? Yeah? Yeah? And Heimdall can see down on earth, and Thor can't, and he goes to his friend and he says, how is she doing? And Heimdall says something. He says, she searches for you always. She's looking up to the heavens, searching for you. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father. If Jesus Christ leans over to his Father's ear and says, how's she doing? What could he say, the Father, about you? Do you search for Christ always? We should be searching for him. And one of the ways that God has called us 
commanded us to search for him is to study the scripture, to show ourselves approved. And in this study, we have been studying the prophecies, especially concerning Israel. We studied Ezekiel 38 about that collaboration of nations that would come against Israel that included Russia, Iran, Turkey, uh, possibly different other countries that are a little bit more speculative. We saw many evidences of that collaboration in the days we and guys when you turn on the TV we are listening to Biblical prophecy, even in the pagan stations, which I encourage you to stop watching CNN, Al Jazeera, and BBC. Find your own news outlets on the internet if you want to know what's going on. They're lying to you, the other ones. And so we see this happening with Israel, and we look to, to God through the scriptures on what he has to say about this. Culminating in our last week here, we studied Daniel chapter 9 last week in regards to a prophetic calendar that God gave the nation of Israel in 70 weeks of seven years. Now, if you're a visitor, you're probably going to get lost if you weren't here last week. But God sends Gabriel, that angel, powerful angel, that messenger angel to Daniel after Daniel discovers that they only have three years left in the Babylonian captivity because God said he was going to set them free after 70 years because they disobeyed the sabbatic agricultural command of letting the year rest once every six years on the seventh year. They disobeyed for 490 years and therefore God said, you're going away for 70 years so the land can rest. (sighs) Was that too much? And so they're in captivity and Daniel's like, wait, I'm reading Jeremiah. I'm reading the books. We only got a couple years left. He's 85 years old. He's excited. He starts praying, praying for forgiveness for the nation, praying for his own forgiveness, reminding God of his promise to set them free after 70 years. And God is so pleased with Daniel that he sends Gabriel. And you remember, let me read it to you. Verse 24 of Daniel 9. 70 weeks are determined. We learned extensively last week. That means 70 weeks of seven years. So 490 years are determined for the nation of Israel, the people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal a vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details regarding these six. We went into immense detail regarding to make reconciliation for sin, and we saw the evidence of that is talking about the cross of Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem on a donkey as it was prophesied that he would ride a donkey. He comes in as the Messiah to Jerusalem to be cut off from his people. An incredible prophecy. Amazing. You guys learned this next week. You learned this last week. but all of the fulfillments of all six, including to make reconciliation for iniquity, has everything to do with the nation of Israel itself, including to finish the transgression. I I, I don't want to spend a lot of time into this because I have a whole sermon, but listen. The um, transgression of Israel as a foundation to understanding the fulfillment of all all of this is the apostasy of Israel. Israel has been apostate now for 2,000 years, and all through the Old Testament, they were up and down with God. They would repent, follow him, um, prosperity would come, and they would forget him, and then they would go into apostasy. So now this apostasy of the nation of Israel has gone on for 2,000 years, and it's going to come again similarly to the Old Testament when they would be judged by God, they would repent, they would recognize God for who he is, and they wouldn't be apostate anymore. And now, after 2,000 years of apostasy, the nation of Israel is having the attention from the rest of the world... And we as Christians need to understand God's plan for Israel as it also pertains to us for the end times events. 
And so, God is saying, in this, there is a 70-week calendar for Israel, and most of these are the fulfillment of different times in the 70th week of Daniel. Now, if you could just put up for a few minutes and then take it down that um, chart that we had last week, you guys can look at this. Gabriel says 70 weeks of 70 years, Shabim Shaboah, the Hebrew language, 490 years are determined for your people in the holy city. And then he gets down into, okay, verse 25, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to re- Store and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks. And then after seven weeks, 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. So the seven weeks, the street shall be built and the wall in troubled times. And then the 62 weeks, then this is going to happen. After 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And for the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end shall be a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Till end of what war? This word flood is not talking about a water flood. The word flood means assault or military attack. 30,000 Roman troops flooded in 70 AD Jerusalem as Jesus Christ prophesied. In Luke chapter 19, which we looked at last week, and he said not one stone would remain upon another. You know what's fascinating? We always want to look at something that we worship. We always want to look at something. We look at people, we look at careers, we look at buildings, we look at places of worship, and we begin to worship those things rather than the true living God. The Jews' example of this is the temple. Do you remember when the disciples were walking with Jesus Christ in Jerusalem and they started bragging on the temple? Do you guys remember that? It's an incredible portion of scripture. And the disciples like, hey, Jesus, look at the temple. Look at its beauty. Look at its grandeur. Isn't it amazing? And you know what? They probably expected Jesus Christ to say, hey, it is. I told you guys to build it. Remember in the Old Testament? And yeah, you guys did it. You you had some trouble along the way, but you you really did a good job. And look at it. You're right. Does Jesus do that? No. He tells them the very thing that they worship over God is going to be destroyed. Do you remember? And you know what's interesting? All this debate, I heard a very fine preacher yesterday who I enjoy so much, so much so I won't give you his name because he has a totally bunk wrong view of Daniel 9. Now, he still believes it's literal, but I totally disagree with his assessment of all these things. Anyways, one of the things that is the argument of prophecies, you can't take prophecy literally. You can't take prophecy literally. That is so wrong, people. You can even take minute details of prophecy literally, like when Jesus Christ said, when they were bragging on worshiping at the temple more than actually worshiping him, they said, he said to them, I tell you the truth. They're going to come in. They're going to destroy this temple, and not one stone will remain upon another do you guys remember that? And so in Daniel 9, it's going to talk, it, it mentions this destruction just now. A flood will come in. There's going to be a war. Desolations are determined. Israel, Jerusalem, it's going to be destroyed. Jesus enhances our understanding of that prophecy along with different portions of the Old Testament and Matthew 24. His disciples come to him and they say, hey, Jesus, What is the sign of the end times and the sign of your second coming? Do you remember what Jesus says in in Daniel 20, or excuse me, Matthew 24? He says, it was written by the prophet Daniel. 
That's how you're going to know the end of times. And then he tells them about the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel, which is going to be the focus of our remaining study today. So you think it's not important because it's Old Testament? Jesus Christ, when asked the question, what's the sign of your coming and the sign of end times? He says, are you reading Daniel? Because it's all there. It was spoken about the prophet Daniel. There's going to be abomination of desolations. The Antichrist is going to come into the temple during the 70th week, which we're going to get into that. And when this happens, run for the hills, and it's going to be bad news for women who were pregnant in Jerusalem during that time. Now, back to what he says to his disciples about, he says, what, not one stone is going to be upon another. Okay, that's a prophecy. The temple is going to be destroyed, but not one stone upon another. Nah, that's a figurative thing. That's just him saying it's going to be desolated, and that's what that means. No, 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 no. Literal. Literal, literal, literal. Get that in your head when you're thinking of prophecy. Because when they rode in, and check this out, when they rode into Jerusalem, 30,000 Roman soldiers under Titus in 70 AD, they killed 1.1 million Jews. Then they led the rest of them out of Israel into captivity because they didn't know the day of the Messiah's coming. And they burned the temple with fire. Do you guys know what's in the temple? Gold. The, the heat was so much that gold melted into all of the stones in the temple. And guess what the Roman authorities had their soldiers do? They took every stone and broke them apart from the other stones so they could retrieve the gold that melted in between. That's like, a, you know, when we talk about the cross, we get a lot of amens. That's an amen moment, ladies and gentlemen. Not one stone remained upon another. Not one stone. So, moving on to verse 27 of Daniel 9. We covered 69 weeks. Remember, 69 weeks. Let's review it, and then we'll go into the 70th week. 69 weeks we covered. When the command goes forth, and I know a lot of people came up to me last time, they're like, yeah, awesome, but I still don't have a handle on it. I get it. Simple. One week is seven years, right? How many is one week? One week is how much? Okay, good. And then... We have seven weeks from when the command goes forth to the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its temple. It's 49 years. It took them 49 years to rebuild Jerusalem and its temple. That's a historical fact. And then another 62 weeks after the 49 years, which is 434 years, which is a total of 49 plus 434 is 483. And then the Messiah is going to come in and he's going to be cut off from his people. He's going to come into Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified. That happened. Even if you want to debate on the day, that's fine. I don't want to get dogmatic on that. But it happened. About 483 years later, Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem and he was cut off on the cross from his people. So we have one week left. We've had 69 weeks. 62 plus 7, 69. There's one week. That is the 70th week that we're talking about today, all that I just said was only introduction. Then, verse 27, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. We have between verse 26 and the beginning of verse 27, a period that gives us a dispensational gap called the church age. Now, if you are going to sit there, and, and I don't blame you because this is what I did when I first heard this. I, I, when I heard this taught the first time, I thought, you can't throw a gap in whenever you want to suit your theology or eschatology. Why do you say, so it's not 490 consecutive years? It was 483 consecutive years, and then you're just deciding that there's a gap from there? 
Yes, we are. But we're doing it based on evidence. Here's some evidence for you. Throughout scripture and prophecy, there are gaps all the time. One of them I would like to show you is Isaiah chapter 9, and I'll read this to you. You don't have to turn there unless you really want to, to see if I'm telling you the truth, because you know pastors lie. It says in verse 6, it's a famous Christmas verse, Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government. Do you see what just happened there? There will be no end. There's a period. It's giving us the time when Jesus Christ comes, and then it fast forwards to the millennial period after the 70th week of Daniel, which is the 70 year tribulation, seven year tribulation. So, He's going to be born. This is his titles. And then the government will be upon his shoulder. uh, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David over his kingdom in order to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There's a gap. There's a gap from the time when the Messiah comes until the end of the tribulation period. The government is not upon his shoulders. He has not set up his millennial kingdom and it will be established with judgment and justice forever. And the zeal of the Lord will perform this. This is God saying, I will establish my kingdom in the thousand year millennial reign after the seven year tribulation period. So you see that there's a gap. And the way that, well, I'll I'll say the, the way that we know the gaps are verified in a moment, but... Here's even greater proof that Daniel 9 has a gap from its 69th week and 70th week, and that is Luke chapter 4. I'm going to read it for you. Something incredible happens, guys. Luke chapter 4. I would lose a a Bible drill right now because I didn't turn there very fast. Luke chapter 4, Jesus Christ comes into his ministry. He's ready. Okay? He's been tested by the enemy. He's been baptized. The Holy Spirit is upon him. And he goes into the temple, the synagogue, rather, on the Sabbath day, on their worship day. It says there in verse 16 of Luke 4, Then he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 61, and we're going to turn there too. He turns to the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he found the place where it was written, which was harder for them, not Jesus, but for them because they didn't have chapter and verse, And this is what Jesus Christ says, repeating the prophecy of Isaiah. You guys with me? If you're a visitor, our motto is growing deeper together in the word. So Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it to the attendant who sat down. The eyes were all on him in the synagogue, and he began to say, what? Today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Here's a prophecy, fulfilled today. Day. Isn't that incredible? But now that you go to Isaiah 61, l- l- look at this. This is where he quotes from Isaiah 61, verse 1. And he says, 
The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, comma. And Jesus Christ stops reading Isaiah and he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. Why doesn't he continue to read if the prophecy included the fulfillment that day because the rest of this that is only separated by a comma is talking about another prophecy being fulfilled on another day. What's the prophecy? The 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year tribulation. It's known as the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all those who mourn in Zion. It goes on to console those who mourn in Zion. Wow. So not only is there a gap in Daniel, the gap in Isaiah 61 that Jesus talked about in Luke 4 is directly referencing the Messiah coming in to the world and then the 70th week of Daniel, proving there are gaps in the 69th week and the 70th week. In other words, people, we are the people of the comma. There has been 2,000 year break from the 69th week to the 70th week that is the seven year tribulation period called the dispensation of the church age. And when we are taken out, the 70th week begins. Listen, listen to this. Now we know this. Oh wait, let me give you further proof. Further proof. That is number one proof that there is a gap because there's other gaps in prophecies all the time. Secondly, because there's a gap, there's a gap directly in Isaiah 61 talking about the two same events. Thirdly, third reason we should assume there is a gap in the 69th and 70th week is this. The New Testament reveals to us information we have no clue about in the Old Testament including the seven-year tribulation. What's the only other seven-year tri- oh, week that hasn't happened? It's spoken of in Revelation, and it hasn't happened yet. There's other things like this. Did Satan, and I'm going to engage you here, did Satan and Michael dispute about the location of the body of Moses? Yes or no? Yes. Where does it say that? Jude. Jude. New Testament. If Jude wasn't written, none of us would know that they're disputing over the body, right? Who are Janus and Jambrius? Janus and Jambrius are the two magicians in Exodus that turned the stick, like God did, into a snake. Where do we learn their names? 2 Timothy chapter 3. Did you learn them in Exodus? No. We would have never known that Moses' body was being disputed by Satan and Michael, and we would have never known the names of those magicians if the New Testament wasn't written. And I will concede this. We would have never known where the 70th week of Daniel was going to be unless the book of Revelation was written. You follow me? Good, so now that we've proven that, we go into this time period of the 70th week, which is how many years? You guys are so good. I don't even know why I'm preaching right now. He, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering on the wing of abominations that shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. End of the chapter, 70 weeks of Daniel. Listen, guys, he's talking about a seven-year tribulation and then gives us the details of what's going to happen in the middle of the seven years. Half of seven is what? Three and a half. Now, I would concede. Let me repeat. I would concede 
if we didn't have New Testament revelation that would verify Daniel 9's prophecy. Do you know that in Revelation 11, it says after 42 months, the Antichrist, he's going to come in and bring the abomination of desolation? If that was not convincing enough, in Revelation, it tells you the exact days, 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. I'm not looking at my notes, so I, I took a guess on the days, but it says it in Revelation 11. Go home and read it. So the very seven-year tribulation period spoken of in Revelation is the very period being spoken of right now in Daniel chapter 9, the very thing that Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 24, that after three and a half years, the abomination of desolation is going to happen, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, is the very thing in Revelation that says after 42 months, this is going to happen. It doesn't get any simpler than that. Now... Listen, as I'm closing here, in the next half hour, I'm kidding. Do you know the third most talked about subject in all of the scripture for those who are still doubting and annoyed with all this prophecy? Number one subject is the atonement of Jesus Christ in all of scripture. Number two is the second coming of Christ. Do you know what the third most talked about event and subject, not just event, event and subject in all of scripture is, is the 70th week of Daniel, the seven year tribulation period. There's many names for it. It's called the tribulation, the great tribulation, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the time of Jacob's trouble, a time of trouble, a time of distress, the day of vengeance, the day of the Lord's wrath, the wrath of the lamb, which is an oxymoron. None of us thinks about a lamb being wrathful towards us, do we? You don't see a lamb and go, ah! But the lamb is gonna, he's gonna hurt people in the seven-year tribulation period. He's gonna hurt their feelings bad. Listen, guys. Don't you think God would have us talked about the third most talked about event in scripture at our church? Yes. That is a rhetorical question. Yes. Yes, and that's why we're talking about it. And that's why we've been in prophecy for four weeks, even with the break with our guest speakers. Because Israel's on the news. The Ezekiel 38 war is imminent. I don't know the day or the hour of it. I don't. But I believe it's imminent. I believe the rapture is imminent. I believe that the book of Revelation is true. And isn't it comforting to know who's in charge of it all? Now, last week I ended, and I want to end the same way, uh, uh, way this week as the worship team comes up. In Matthew chapter 16, because I felt rushed last time, Matthew chapter 16. They come up to him the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and they say, hey, show us a sign that you're the Messiah. Show us the sign that you're the Son of God. So what's the subject? The identity of Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ says, you guys can tell weather patterns, but you don't know the signs and the times of the Messiah. That's the subject. You know the times and the signs of the Messiah. In other words, Jesus Christ is saying, it is easier... To discern when Messiah is in front of you than it is to know if it's going to rain. And guys, we can predict that it's going to rain at least this year in Kenya. I know some of you Kenyans think you know it's going to rain the same hour because you're all weather people. You ask a Kenyan man if it's going to rain, he will give you a whole book on when it's going to rain. He'll walk outside, lick his finger and go it's going to rain in three hours. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, is saying, hey, hey, you can tell who I am better than you can tell if it's going to rain. And you can tell that I was coming. A wicked and perverse. Why are they wicked and perverse for asking for a sign? 
He says, a wicked and perverse generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given except the prophet Jonah, which is the resurrection. That's it. That's the only other thing you're going to get. Let me tell you something. I want to bring this to an application today. I know that we can seek after God's will with a good heart to try to find the open doors. But if you are seeking after whether or not God loves you and his word is true, after all the evidence already given, and you base signs off of whether or not you're going to follow him, school fees, somebody gets healed. You don't want somebody to die. Nobody wants our family members to die. But that determines whether or not you follow Jesus Christ and believe in his word. We are no better than the wicked and perverse generation of the religious leaders of the New Testament. And it needs to stop, ladies and gentlemen. Stop doubting Jesus Christ. And believe in his word. If this Daniel 9 was not evidence enough. In other words, this is the deal. If Daniel 9 was not evidence enough that the word of God is true and Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah and King and God and creator, nothing else in the world could ever cause you to follow God. Do you see it? Stop seeking after signs and follow after the one, Jesus Christ, who made so many prophecies of his coming and he fulfilled them. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Lord, we thank you for your word, how powerful and true and inerrant and infallible it is. You're, you're so good to us to have given us such clarity to have given us such a word that we can lean on and have confidence in, and we praise you for that. Lord, I also praise you for the uh, ability to, and privilege we have to give of our offering. I do pray you would grant us wisdom through the administration of these gifts that we may expand your kingdom and worship you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.